I think I've mentioned this before, but for those who are new or visiting this morning, something you should know about me is that I am hopelessly type A. And I put all of my sermons into a spreadsheet. It goes back <laughs> years. I know, I know. They're organized by scripture, and they're marked with the date that they were delivered. And I include links to other things I used when writing them, like poems and articles and even pieces of art. And I've been here at Hyde Park Union Church long enough that the scriptures are repeating. We follow the lectionary, which runs in three-year cycles, and so, a bit of math, since this is my fifth year here, there are days where we're covering texts that I've preached before. And thanks to my handy-dandy spreadsheet, I can go back and read my previous sermons on a given text. Organization counts for something. And so I can go back and see what I prepared for the first Sunday of Lent years ago. The last time I preached this text was March 1st, 2020. I actually wrote two sermons for that Sunday. I wrote the first over the course of the work week, and I wrote the second, the one that I actually preached, all on Saturday night. Because March 1st was the day after Alvin Palmer, our former Sexton, beloved staff member, died. And March 1st, though we didn't know it yet, was also the second to last in-person service we had before the COVID lockdown. I want to read you something from that 2020 sermon. I wrote, this isn't the sermon I planned to preach this morning. That's the way of the world, isn't it? You write one sermon, you prepare for things to go one way, and then it all gets turned upside down in the blink of an eye. We find ourselves at the beginning of Lent faced with the inevitability of the wilderness. I reread that sermon this week, and I thought to myself, I didn't know anything about the wilderness. That Sunday morning was painful, but I thought that was the wilderness. I thought that was the wilderness. I was just at the entry gate to the wilderness. I was at the periphery of the wilderness. I had no idea how far the wilderness would go. I didn't know who we would lose. I didn't know the suffering I would witness. I didn't know how terrified I would feel or how alone I would feel some days. I didn't know the violence and the hatred we would see repeated over and over and over again. I didn't know the parts of myself that would be stripped away. My friends, I'm not the person who stood in this pulpit three years ago. I have been laid low by the wilderness. When I think about the wilderness, I think about the desert. I claim Alabama as my home. It's where I was raised, but it's not where I was born. I was born in Arizona. I was born in the desert. And people think that the desert is barren, that there's nothing there, that it's all sand and beige and tumbleweed, that there's nothing to see. But if you're in the desert long enough, as maybe some of you have been, you start to notice things. 
You notice the flowers that bloom on the cactus. You notice the variations of color in the sand. You start to see that there's this creativity of life in a harsh place. You start to notice that there's this beautiful wildness alongside the wilderness. There's a pastor named Tim Keel who Veronica and I met on a trip to Kansas City. And he said this thing that I've thought about so often since then. He said, we've come to expect that most of our lives as Christians or as the church will take place in the promised land. And yet most of the Bible is about wilderness. Moses, Job, Jonah, Abraham, and Sarah, Esther, John the Baptist, Jesus himself, they all experience wilderness literally and figuratively. Which means that there's something here for us in these wild spaces. There's something here for us even when we have been laid low. Today is the first Sunday of Lent, a period of time where we intentionally contemplate and engage with the wilderness. We're at the beginning of our 40-day journey, but we meet Jesus in this text at the end of his. He's just spent 40 days and 40 nights fasting in the wilderness, a period of time that connects him with his spiritual ancestors. Noah and his family spent 40 days and 40 nights in that flood. And Moses waited on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights for the Ten Commandments. Jesus, we're told, is famished. Perhaps he too has been laid low by the wilderness. And it's at this moment that evil shows up. Temptation. It can come for any of us at any time, but temptation is often at its most tempting when we are at our lowest. Evil shows up and offers Jesus a choice. Are you going to follow the path of God? Or are you going to follow the path of empire? You can see this choice depicted artistically in the cover of today's bulletin. Will it be God's wild creation? Or will it be the riches and dominance of political empire? The temptation comes three times. First, Jesus is offered the temptation of immediacy. Command these stones to become loaves of bread. And this might seem like a small little thing. What's the big deal? Jesus is hungry. He has the power to do it. Why not make a quick little snack? Yet the underlying implication goes something like this. Evil offers a different sort of world. One where every impulse is immediately satisfied. Baking bread usually takes time and effort. Yet evil would have Jesus and us believe in a world with no challenge, no effort, and no need for patience. Evil would have us skip to the end of the journey. It tempts us with the promise of the kingdom without the cross. And in doing so would have us abandon the real world around us. Evil wants us to forget that real creation work takes time. And it takes effort. And it takes care for what's actually here in our community. One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Next, Jesus is offered the temptation of fame. Throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command the angels concerning you. Eva wants Jesus to make a spectacle. 
to throw himself from this high point so that the angels will rescue him, to attract people through a dramatic public act. And he could do it. He could. Jesus could easily compel a crowd with showmanship alone. Evil would have Jesus and us believe that fame will bring fulfillment, that fame will accomplish our goal. Evil would have us believe that attracting a crowd is the same thing as doing good work. Now, Jesus will ultimately draw crowds, to be sure. It's not the crowds themselves that are a problem. But he does it not through arbitrary spectacle. Jesus will gain followers, to be sure, but not through emotional manipulation. Jesus got attention because of his authenticity, because he connected with people, because he healed people, and because he taught people. Jesus did not strive for a life celebrated, but for a life together. Again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Finally, Jesus is offered the temptation of political and financial domination. All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. It's almost like the previous two were just a warm-up for this one. <laughs> Evil presents Jesus with everything, everything. Evil would have Jesus and us believe that this is the ultimate goal, to be rich, and powerful to hold the, the keys to every earthly kingdom in our hands. The ultimate goal is to win or to have our people win. And evil can be really tricky with this one, I think. Jesus, you would make such a good leader. Think of the change you could make. Think of the good you could do. The world would be better off and you and your family and all your friends, you would be set for the rest of your life. And you just have to do this one little thing. You just have to worship me. Again, it's, it's not the power. That power itself is a problem. It's the kind of power that evil's talking about. The kind of power that plunders. The kind of power that occupies. The kind of power that is power over other people instead of power with. Or power that comes alongside and says, I'm, I'm bringing you with me, my friend. Power born of mutual care. Worship the Lord your God. And serve only God. Temptation for come, can come for us at any time. At any time, it can come for us. We're at the top of our game or on just an average, ordinary Wednesday. But evil is particularly tempting in the wilderness. It's particularly tempting in seasons of life when immediacy or notoriety or domination feel like they're a way out. And then there's the fourth temptation. There's a fourth temptation, I believe, in this text. A temptation that aligns us not with Jesus, but with the tempter himself. The fourth temptation is to see Jesus as one of these things. The fourth temptation is to see Jesus as a magician who gives us exactly what we want. To see Jesus as a celebrity or to see Jesus as a politician. Oh, and it is so tempting in the wilderness to see Jesus as a magician, to seek Jesus as one who will magically turn stone to bread, to seek Jesus as the one who will remove any obstacle in our path, who will help us skip the labor of the journey. As if Jesus himself didn't see his journey through from beginning to end. 
Oh, and it's so tempting in the wilderness to seek Jesus as a celebrity, to treat Jesus as a brand, to commercialize him, to make Jesus a dramatic spectacle that gets views but changes absolutely nothing. As if Jesus wasn't the very one who advocated a dramatic reversal of society itself, saying, blessed are you who are poor and who are hungry and who are ignored, for yours is the kingdom of God. Ugh, and it is so tempting in the wilderness to seek Jesus as a politician, to make Jesus small enough that he is the possession of one political party or just one country, to believe that we own Jesus or to believe that Jesus wants us to dominate the other, whoever that other is, in his name. As if Jesus isn't the one who was killed on a tool of state oppression. Evil obscures Jesus as Savior. It obscures Jesus as the healer. It obscures Jesus as the God who is with us. Temptation is in the wilderness. But it's not the only thing there. If you're in the wilderness long enough, you start to notice things. You notice the flowers on the cactus. You notice the variations of color in the sand. You start to see the wildness of the Holy Spirit all around you. You look up and you realize that Jesus is there with you. You start to see the face of God in the moments of joy and the moments of pain. I will say honestly that in the past three years I have been laid low by the wilderness. There's no fame to holding someone's hand on the day of their death. There's no financial gain to presiding over a COVID funeral. There's no political benefit to visiting someone in jail or in the hospital or calling a grieving friend or facing your own fear. But these wild human moments, when I think about it, I wouldn't trade them for anything. Because they are my flowers in the desert. They are the variations of color that I see in the sand. And as I've stayed in the wilderness, I've come to remember what has been born of the wilderness and the wildness. That Jesus came out of the wilderness. That prophets, revolutionaries came out of the wilderness. That great art came out of the wilderness. That on this day especially, that spirituals and jazz, my God, jazz came out of the wilderness. Leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and theologians like James Cone came out of the wilderness. So I've been laid low by the wilderness, but so have they. And there's power here. And so I think I'll stay a while until God sees fit to bring us out. Amen.